I'm analyzing Al Gore. What a bore. Talking about that's the wrong cave, sorry. Sunlight on his face woke him, but made him shut his eyes again. It streamed unhindered down the slope, collected itself into rivulets, attracted swarms of flies which flew low over his forehead. Circles circled, sought to land, and were overtaken by fresh swarms. When he tried to whisk them away, he discovered that he was bound. A thin rope cut into his arms. He dropped them, opened his eyes, and looked down at himself. His legs were tied all the way up to his thighs. A single length of rope was tied around his ankles, crisscrossed all the way up his legs, and encircled his hips, his chest, and his arms. He could not see where it was knotted. He showed no sign of fear or hurry, though he thought he was unable to move until he discovered that the rope allowed his legs some free play, and that round his body it was almost loosed. His arms were tied to each other, but not to his body, and had some free play too. This made him smile and it occurred to him that perhaps children had been playing a practical joke on him. You can't see the sunglasses from back and back. Sorry. That's nice butt time. He tried to feel for his knife, but again the rope cut softly into his flesh. He tried again, more cautiously this time, but his pocket was empty. Not only his knife, but the little money that he had on him, as well as his coat, were missing. His shoes had been pulled from his feet and taken too. When he moistened his lips, he tasted blood. Wow! Come on! <laughs> Jesus! We're gonna have to put you in the corner, Ty. He tasted blood, which had flowed from his temples down his cheeks, his chin, his neck, and under his shirt. His eyes were painful. If he kept them open for long, he saw reddish stripes in the sky. He decided to stand up. He drew his knees up as far as he could, rested his hands on the fresh grass, and jerked himself to his feet. I was almost worried about that sentence for a second. I'm a little gun shy after the green peepees in the Discord. He collapsed to the ground again, half out of his mind with pain, and then tried again. He went on trying until the blood started flowing from his hidden wheels, then he lay still again for a long while and let the sun and the flies do what they liked. When he awoke for the second time, the elder bush had cast its shadow over him, and the coolness stored in it was pouring from between his branch between its branches. He must have been hit on the head. They must have laid him down carefully, just as a mother lays her baby behind a bush when she goes off to work in the fields. Wow. His chances all lay in the amount of free play allowed him by the rope. He dug his elbows into the ground and tested. As soon as the rope tautened, he stopped. He tried again more cautiously. If he had been able to reach the branch over his head, he could have used it to drag himself to his feet, but he could not reach it. He laid his head back on the grass, rolled over, and struggled to his knees. He tested the ground with his toes and then managed to stand up almost without effort. A few paces away lay the path across the plateau, and among the grass were pinks and thistles in bloom. He tried to lift his foot to avoid trampling them, but the rope around his ankles prevented him. He looked down at himself. The rope was knotted at his ankles and ran around his legs in a kind of playful pattern. He carefully bent down and tried to loosen it, but loose though it seemed to be, he could not make it any looser. To avoid treading on the thistles with his bare feet, he hopped over them like a bird. The crackling of a twig made him stop. People in this district were very prone to laughter. He was alarmed by the thought that he was in no position to defend himself. He hopped on until he reached the path. Bright fields stretched far below. He could see no sign of the nearest village, and if he could move no faster than this, night would fall before he reached it. He tried walking and discovered that he could put one foot before the other if he lifted each foot a definite distance from the ground and then put it down again before the rope tautened. In the same way, he could actually swing his arms a little. After the first step, he fell. He fell right across the path and made the dust fly. He expected this to be a, a sign for the long-suppressed laughter to break out, but all remained quiet. He was alone. As soon as the dust had settled, 
He got up and went on. He looked down and watched the rope slacken, grow taut, and then slacken again. When the first glowworms appeared, he managed to look up. He felt in control of himself again, and his impatience to reach the nearest village faded. Hunger made him lightheaded, and he seemed to be going so fast that not even a motorcycle could overtake him. Alternatively, he felt as if he were standing still, and the earth was rushing past him, like a river flowing past a man swimming against the stream. The stream carried branches, which had been bent southwards by the north wind, stunted young trees and patches of grass with bright long stalked flowers. It ended by submerging the bushes and the young trees, leaving only the sky and the man above the water level. The moon had risen and illuminated the bare, curved summit of the plateau. The path, which was overgrown with young grass, the bound man making his way along it with quick, measured steps and two hares, which ran across the hill just in front of him and vanished down the slope. Though the nights were still cool this time of year, before midnight the bound man lay down at the edge of the es es I hate this word, escarpment and went to sleep. A plateau. It's a plateau. It's a freaking plateau. Okay. In the light of the morning, the animal tamer who was camping with his circus in the field outside the village saw the man bound coming down the path, gazing thoughtfully at the ground. The bound man stopped and bent down. He held out one arm to keep his balance and with the other picked up the empty wine bottle. Then he straightened himself and stood erect again. He moved slowly to avoid being cut by the rope. But two, the circus proprietor, what he did suggest the voluntary limitation of an enormous swiftness of movement. He was enchanted by its extraordinary gracefulness. And while the bound man looked about for a stone on which to break the bottle, so that he could use the splintered neck to cut the rope, the animal tamer, tamer walked across the field and approached him. The first leaps of a young panther had never filled him with such delight. Wow. So, ladies and gentlemen, the bound man. His first movements let loose a storm of applause, which out of sheer excitement caused the blood to rush to the cheeks of the animal tamer standing at the edge of the arena. The bound man rose to his feet. His surprise whenever he did this was like that of a four-footed animal which had managed to stand on its hind legs. He knelt, stood up, jumped, and turned cartwheels. The spectators found it as astonishing as if they had seen a bird which voluntarily remained earthbound and confined itself to hopping. The bound man became an enormous draw. His absurd steps and little jumps his elementary exercises in movement made the rope dancer superfluous. His fame grew from village to village, but the motions he went through were few and always the same. They were really quite ordinary motions, which he had continually practiced, had to continually to practice in the daytime in the half dark tent in order to retain his shackled freedom. In that, he remained entirely within the limits set by his rope. He was free from it, did not confine him, but gave him wings and empowered his leaps and jumps with purpose. Just as flights of birds of passage have purpose when they take wing in the warmth of the summer and hesitantly make small circles in the sky. All the children of the neighborhood started playing the game of Bound Man. They formed rival gangs, and one day the circus people found a little girl lying bound in a ditch with a cord tied around her neck so she could hardly breathe. They released her, and at the end of the performance that night, the bound man made a speech. He announced briefly that there was no sense in being tied up in such a way that you could not jump. After that, he was regarded as a comedian. Grace and sunlight, tent pegs driven into the ground and pulled up again and on to the next village. Ladies and gentlemen, the bound man. The summer mounted towards its climax. It bent its face deeper over the fish ponds and the hollows, taking a delight in its dark reflection, skimmed the surface of rivers, and made the plain into what it was. Everyone who could walk went to see the bound man. Many wanted a close-up view of how he was bound. So the circus proprietor announced after each performance that anyone who wanted to satisfy himself that the knots were real and the rope was not made of rubber was at liberty to do so. The bound man generally waited for the crowd in the area outside the tent. 
He laughed to remain serious and held out his arms for inspection. Many took the opportunity to look him in the face. Others gravely tested the rope, tried the knots on his ankles, and wanted to know exactly how the length compared with the length of his limbs. They asked him how he had come to be tied up like that, and he answered patiently, always saying the same thing. Yes, he had been tied up, he said. And when he awoke, he found that he had been robbed as well. Those who had done it must have been pressed for time because they had tied him up somewhat too loosely for someone who had not supposed to be able to move and somewhat too tightly for someone who was expected to be able to move. But he did move, people pointed out. Yes, he replied. What else could he do? Before he went to bed, he always sat for a time in front of the fire. When the circus proprietor asked him why he didn't make up a better story, he always answered that he hadn't made up that one and blushed and preferred staying in the shade. The difference between him and the other performers was that when the show was over, he did not take off his rope. The result was that every movement that he made was worth seeing, and the villagers used to hang about the camp for hours just for the sake of seeing him get up from in front of the fire and roll himself in his blanket. Sometimes the sky was beginning to lighten when he saw their shadow disappear. The circus proprietor often remarked that there was no reason why he should not be untied after the evening performance and tied up again the next day. He pointed out that the rope dancers, for instance, did not stay on their rope overnight, but no one took the idea of untying him seriously. For the bound man's fame rested on the fact that he was always bound, that whenever he washed himself, he had to wash his clothes too and vice versa, and that his only way of doing so was to jump in the river just as he was every morning when the sun came out, and that he had to be careful not to go too far out for, for, oh my gosh, for fear of being carried away by the stream. The proprietor was well aware that what was the last resort protected the bound man from the jealousy of the other performers was his helplessness. He deliberately left them the pleasure of watching him groping painfully from stone to stone on the riverbank every morning with his wet clothes clinging to him. When his wife pointed out that even the best clothes would not stand up indefinitely to such treatment, and the bound man's clothes were by no means the best, he replied curtly that it was not going to last forever. That was his answer to all objections. It was for the summer season only. But when he said this, he was not being serious. He was talking like a gambler who had no intention of giving up his vice. In reality, he would, have been, he would have been prepared cheerfully to sacrifice his lions and his rope dancers for the bound man. He proved this on the night when the rope dancers jumped over the fire. Afterwards, he was convinced that they did it, not because it was Midsummer's Day, but because of the bound man, who was, as usual, lying and watching them with that peculiar smile that might have been real or might have been only the effect of the glow on his face. In any case, no one knew anything about him, because he never talked about anything that had happened to him before he emerged from the wood that day. Thank you, Ty. That evening, two of the performers suddenly picked him up by the arms and legs, carried him off, or carried him to the edge of the fire, and started playfully swinging him to and fro, while two others held out their arms to catch him on the other side. And in the end, they threw him, but too short. The two men on the other side drew back. They explained afterwards that they did so the better to take the shock. The result was the bound man landed at the very edge of the flames and would have been burned if the circus proprietor had not seized his arms and quickly dragged him away to save the rope which was starting to get singed. He was certain that the object had been the that the object had been to burn the rope. He sacked the four men on the spot. A few nights later, the proprietor's wife awakened by the sound of footsteps on the grass and went outside just in time to prevent the clown from playing his last practical joke. He was carrying a pair of scissors. When he was asked for an explanation, he insisted that he had no intention of taking the bound man's life, but only wanted to cut his rope because he felt sorry for him. But he was sacked too. These antics amused the bound man because he could have freed himself if he had wanted to whenever he liked, but perhaps he felt, or but perhaps he wanted to learn a few new jumps first. The children's rhyme, 
We travel with the circus. We travel with the circus. Sometimes occurred to him while he lay awake at night. He could hear the voices of spectators on the opposite, opposite bank who had been driven too far downstream by the way home. He could see the river gleaming in the moonlight and the young shoots growing out of the thick tops of the willow tree and did not think about autumn yet. The circus proprietor dreaded the danger involved for the bound man by sleep. Attempts, attempts were continually made to release him while he slept. The chief culprits were sacked rope dancers or children who were bribed for the purpose, but measures could be taken to safeguard against these. A much bigger danger was that he represented to himself in his dreams he forgot the rope and was surprised by it when he woke in the darkness of the morning. He would angrily try to get up, but lose his balance and fall back again. The previous evening's applause was forgotten. Sleep was still too near, his head and neck too free. He was us the opposite of a hanged man. His neck was the only part of him that was free. He had to make sure that at such moments no knife was within his reach, in the early hours of the morning, the circus proprietor sometimes sent his wife to see whether the bound man was all right. He was asleep. She would bend him over him and feel the rope. It had grown hard from dirt and damp. She would test the amount of free play it allowed him and touch his tender wrists and ankles. Oh. The most varied rumors circulated about the band, bound man. Some say he had tied himself up and invented the story of having been robbed. And toward the end of summer, that was the general opinion. Others maintained that he had been tied up at his own request, perhaps in league with the circus proprietor. The hesitant way in which he told his story, his habit of breaking off when the talk got around to the attack on him, contributed greatly to these rumors. Those who still believed in the robbery with violent story were laughed at. Nobody knew what difficulties the circus proprietor had in keeping the bound man, and how often he said he had enough and wanted to clear off for too much of the summer had passed. Later, however, he stopped talking about clearing off. A little sip here, sorry. It's good looking head, okay? Enjoy it. Rathy wants the unicorn inside of these stories. I am. It's all right. I understand. Later, however, he stopped talking about clearing off. When the wife's... Wait. When the, when the proprietor's wife brought him his food by the river and asked him how long he proposed to remain with them, he did not answer. Sorry. Quick pause. Such a variety of people, clowns, freaks, and comics, to say nothing of elephants and tigers, traveled with the circuses that he did not see why a bound man should not travel with the circus too. He told her about the movements he was practicing, the new ones he had discovered, and about a new trick that had occurred to him while he was whisking flies from the animal's eyes. He described to her how he had always anticipated the effect of the rope and always restrained his movements in such a way as to prevent it from ever tautening. And she knew that there were days when he was hardly aware of the rope, when he humped down from the wagon and slapped the flanks of the horses in the morning as if he were moving in a dream. She watched him vault over the bars almost without touching them, and he saw the sun in his face, and he told her that sometimes he felt as if he were not tied up at all. She answered that if he were prepared to be untied, there would never be any need for him to feel tied up. He agreed that he could be untied whenever he felt like it. <laughs> the woman ended by not knowing whether she were more concerned with the man or with the rope that tied him she told him that he could go on traveling with the circuses without his rope but she did not believe it for what would be the point of his antics without his rope and what would he amount to without it without his ropes he would leave them and the happy days would be over she would no longer be able to sit beside him on the stones by the river without rousing suspicion, and she knew that his confined presence and her conversations with him, of which the rope was the only subject, depended on it. Whenever she agreed that the rope had its advantages, he would start talking about how troublesome it was, and whenever he started talking about its advantages, she would urge him to get rid of it. All this seemed as an endless summer in itself. How far... Do I got to go? I'm oh, we're actually not too far off. Uh, okay. 
At other times, she was worried at the thought that she herself hastening the end of her talk. Wait, she was herself hastening the end by her talk. Sometimes she would get up in the middle of the night and run across the grass to where he slept. She wanted to shake him, wake him up, and ask him to keep the rope. But then she would see him lying there. He had thrown off his blanket, and there he lay like a corpse with his legs outstretched and his arms close together, with the rope tied around them. His clothes had suffered from the heat and the water, but the rope had grown no thinner. She felt that he would go on traveling with the circus until the flesh fell off him and exposed the joints. Next morning, she would plead with him more ardently than ever to get rid of the ropes. The increasing coolness of the weather gave her hope. Autumn was coming, and he would not be able to go on jumping into the river with his clothes on much longer. But the thought of losing his rope, about which he had felt indifferent earlier in the season, now depressed him. The songs of the harvesters filled him with foreboding. Summer has gone, summer has gone, but he realized that soon he would have to change his clothes, and he was certain that when he had been untied, it would be impossible to tie him up again exactly the same way. About this time, the proprietor started talking about traveling south that year. The heat changed without transition to quiet, dry, cold, and the fire was kept in all day long. When the bound man jumped down from the wagon, he felt the coldness of grass under his feet. The stalks were bent with ripeness. The horses dreamed on their feet, and the wild animals crouching to leap even in their sleep or seemed to be collecting gloom under the skins which would break out later. On one of these days, a young wolf escaped. The circus proprietor kept quiet about it to avoid spreading alarm, but the wolf soon started raiding cattle in the neighborhood. People at first believed that the wolf had been driven to these parts by the prospect of a severe winter, but the circus soon became suspect. The proprietor could not conceal the loss of the animal from his own employees, so the truth was bound to come out before long. The circus people offered their aid in tracking down the beast to the burgomasters of the neighboring villages, but all their effort were in vain. Eventually, the circus was openly blamed for the damage and the danger, and the spectators stayed away. The bound man went on performing before half-empty seats without losing anything of his amazing freedom of movement. During the day, he wandered among the surrounding hills under the thin, beaten silver of the autumn sky, and whenever he could, lay down where the, long shone, where the sun shone longest. Soon he found a place which the twilight reached last of all, and when at last it reached him, he got up most unwillingly from the withered grass, and coming down the hill, he had to pass through a little wood on its southern slope, and one evening he saw the gleam of two little green lights. He knew that they had come from no church window, and was not for a moment under any illusion about what they were. He stopped. The animal came toward him through the thinning foliage. He could make out its shape, the slant of its neck, its tail, which swept the ground, and its receding head. If he had not been bound, perhaps he would have tried to run away, but as it was, he did not even feel fear. He stood calmly with dangling arms and looked down at the wolf's bristling coat, under which the muscles played like his own underneath the rope. He thought the evening wind was still between him and the wolf when the beast sprang. The man took care to obey his rope. Moving with the deliberate care that he had so often put to the test, he seized the wolf by the throat. Tenderness for a fellow creature arose in him. Tenderness for the upright being concealed in the four-footed. In a moment that resembled the drive of a great bird, he felt a sudden awareness that flying would be possible only if one were tied up in a special way. He flung himself at the animal and brought it to the ground. He felt a slight elation at having lost the fatal advantage of free limbs which causes men to be worsted. The freedom he enjoyed in his struggle was having to adapt every movement of his limbs to the rope that tied him. The freedom of panthers, wolves, and wildflowers that sway in the evening breeze. He ended up lying obliquely down the slope, clasping the animal's hind legs between his own bare feet and its head between his hands. He felt the gentleness of the faded foliage stroking his backs and the back of his hands, and he felt his own grip almost effortly reaching its maximum, and he felt too how he was in no way hampered by the rope. As he left the wood, light rain began to fall and obscured the setting sun. He stopped for a while under the trees at the edge of the wood. 
Beyond the camp and the river, he saw the fields where the cattle grazed and the places where they crossed. Perhaps he would travel south with the circus after all. He laughed softly. It was against all reason. Even if he went on putting up with his joints being covered with sores, which opened and bled when he made certain movements, his clothes would not stand up much longer to the friction of the rope. The circus proprietor's wife tried to persuade her husband to announce the death of the wolf without mentioning that it had been killed by the bound man. She said that even at the time of his greatest popularity, people would have refused to believe him capable of it, and in their persistent angry mood, with the nights getting cooler, they would be more incredulous than ever. The wolf had attacked a group of children at play that day, and nobody would believe that it had really been killed, for the circus proprietor had many wolves, and it was easy enough for him to hang a skin on the rail and allow free entry, but he was not dissuaded. He thought that the announcement of the bound man's act would revive the triumphs of the summer. Wow. That evening, the bound man's movements were uncertain. He stumbled in one of his jumps and fell. Before he managed to get up, he heard some low whistles and cat calls, rather like birds calling at dawn. He tried to get up quickly, as he had done once or twice during the summer, with the result that he tautened the rope and fell back again. He lay still to regain his calm and listened to the boos and cat calls growing in growing in the uproar. Well, bound man, how did you kill the wolf, they shouted. And are you the man who killed the wolf? If he had been one of them, he would have not believed it himself. He thought they had the perfect right to be angry. A circus at this time of the year, a bound man, escaped wolf, and all this en and all of it ending with this? Some groups of spectators started arguing with the, the others, but the greater part of the audience thought the whole thing a bad joke. By the time he got to his feet, there was such a hubbub that he was barely able to make out individual words. He saw people surging up all around him like faded leaves rise, raised by the whirlwind in a circular valley at the center of which all was still. He thought of the golden sunsets the last few days and the cemetery light which lay over the blight of all he had built up during so many nights. The gold frame which the pious hung round dark old pictures, the sudden collapse of everything, filled him with anger. They wanted him to repeat his battle with the wolf. He said that such a thing had no place in circus performance, and the proprietor declared he did not keep animals to have them slaughtered in front of the audience. But the mob stormed the ring and forced them towards the cages. The proprietor's wife made her way between the seats and the exit and managed to get round to the cages from the other side. She pushed aside the attendant whom the crowd had forced to open the cage door, but the spectators dragged her back and prevented her from being prevented the door from being shut. Aren't you, you the woman who used to lie with him by the river in the summer, they called out? How does he hold you in his arms? She shouted back at them, and they needn't believe in the bound man if they didn't want to. They had never deserved him. Painted clowns were good enough for them. The bound man felt that if the bursts of laughter, what he had been expecting ever since early May, what had smelt so sweet all through the summer, no stank. But if they insisted he was ready to take on all the animals in the circus, he had never felt so much at one with his rope. Gently, he pushed the woman aside. Perhaps he would travel south of them after all. He stood in the open doorway of the cage. He saw the wolf's strong young animal rise to its feet, and he heard the proprietor grumbling again about the loss of his exhibits. He clapped his hands to, attack the, to attract the animal's attention, and then when it was near enough, to, he turned to slam the cage door. He looked the woman in the face. Suddenly, he remembered the proprietor's warning to suspect of murderous intentions anyone near him who had a sharp instrument in his hand. At the same moment, he felt the blade on his wrist, as cool as the water of river in autumn, which during the last few weeks he had been barely able to stand. The water curled up in a tangle, in a tangle beside him while he struggled free. He pushed the wound back, but there was no point in anything he did now. He had been insufficiently on his guard against those who wanted to release him, against the sympathy in which they wanted to lull him. Had he lain too long on the riverbank? If she had cut the cord at any other moment, it would have been better than this. He stood in the middle of the cage and rid himself of the rope like a snake, discarding its skin. It amused him to see the spectator shrinking back. Did they realize that he had no choice now? Or that fighting the wolf now would prove nothing whatsoever? At the same time, he felt his blood rush to his feet. He was suddenly weak. The rope, which fell at his feet like a snare, angered the wolf more than the entry of a stranger into its cage. It crouched to spring, 
The man reeled and grabbed the pistol that hung ready at, his, at the side of the cage. Then before anyone could stop him, he shot the wolf between the eyes. The animal reared and touched him in falling. On the way to the river, he heard the footsteps of his pursuers, spectators, the rope dancers, the circus proprietor, and the proprietor's wife, who persisted in the chase longer than anyone else. He hid in a clump of bushes, bushes and listened to them hurrying past, and later on streaming in the opposite direction back to camp. The moon shone on the meadow, and the light of its color was that of both growth and death. When he came to the river, his anger died away. At dawn it seemed to him as if lumps of ice were floating in the water, and as if snow had fallen. Obliterating memory. Wow, that was a surprisingly long story, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me. I hope you found it at least entertaining. But I'm curious, like, really, what people think that story's about. Because that took me on. It was a little confusing. Like, was that his real story? Like, he found himself behind a bush, bound up? And then wandered upon a circus and then ended up staying with the circus. <sighs> yeah, it really is. I mean, at one port part, I was sort of like thinking about how we bind ourselves into like who we are right now, you know, who we think we are. And we sort of live within those confines. I guess within those confines, we're able to achieve you know, like um, what's the word I'm looking for? Ah, almost came to me. Uh, nope, won't come to me. human condition being able to reason away any situation as either good or bad yeah I mean that's interesting take on it too we were talking about like you know just because someone else or other people say that you're bad that doesn't mean you're bad and because other people say you're good that doesn't really mean you're good you know and in a way like I, that's what I think so because We've talked before about you're always changing. I mean, every atom of your body is, is constantly changing. It's exchanging itself. You're never the person you were just a, a moment ago. You're somebody totally new right now. You know? And uh, sort of like how we get bound up in these... In these... Uh, in these perceptions of self. What's going on? Oh, oh wow, that's really cool, dude. What about the cow? I don't know how it feels about having its boobies pulled on, but hey. That's okay. We're all bound anyway. Rabbit's hungry now. I could go for a, I could go for a snack. Does anybody want a snack? Let's get a pizza. There you go, everybody. Enjoy a fresh hot pizza on the house on me. Your pal Griff bringing you the freshest, the hottest pizzas I eat. Something's happened. Something's bad. Okay. Oh, oh God. My arms. My arms. Ah, oh, I just gotta. Ah. It's gotta like. I just got. I just got like a, a little. Yeah. It's right there. It's a little, little itch. You have some engineered dairy ice cream in the freezer? What do you mean engineered? What do you mean by engineered, Pezzy? Alice! What is engineered ice cream? Right, Alice? Alice? It's not from cows? 
What's it from? It's called Brave Robot. Oh my god, what's happening? It's from your mom! Oh, you got me! Okay. Alright, that's fine. That's fine. You got me. She's sleepy. Everybody's sleepy. Alice is sleepy. Alice is sleepy. That was funny. Why didn't it lull for you? That is really cool. Oh, right. Anyhow, it's time for, um, on my schedule, it's time for one of these. That one? Or? Yeah. 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 Let's go. Wow, that was not, that was not smooth. Smooth. 